There's a link with all of her information um, from her Twitter to something else I'm going to let her talk about because it is amazing. Um, but all, all of this stuff, all of this stuff. Uh, do you want to tell us who you are? Sure. So I am Emily Lakdawalla. I'm senior editor and planetary evangelist for the Planetary Society. The Planetary Society is the world's largest non-governmental organization for space research and exploration. We um, educate the public about what goes on in space. We do a lot of political advocacy. We are recently celebrating the fact that the recent budget that Congress passed is really good for planetary science. And uh, we do some technology development. Um, me, mostly, I write blog posts about active and past robotic planetary exploration. I'm a planetary scientist by background, um, but I also used to be a school teacher and an environmental consultant, and we can talk about some of that stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, everybody says, hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. Volume on guests, please. How is the volume? Because I think it sounds good. Little low? Okay, I'll turn. No, I got it. I got it. You don't have to adjust okay. anything on your end. I got I got you. How's that? Is that better? Is this better? Yeah, yeah this, this, see, see, that, that, that's a good test. She already knows. See, someone's like, is she a streamer? No, she is not, but she's not unfamiliar with this kind of stuff. We'll just say I've that. I've got a lot of experience, so. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay, everybody's saying bueno. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, so first, the one thing I really want you to talk about first, because it's so amazing, you have some exciting news. I do. So this is the only physical copy of it in existence, but I wrote a book. You can see it's called The Design and Engineering of Curiosity, How the Mars Rover Performs Its Job. I do want to say that I did not write the title. I wanted to call it How Curiosity Works, but this is an academic publisher. <laughs> um, it's, it's for Springer. And it is 400 pages of everything you always wanted to know about curiosity, but were afraid to ask. Yeah. And um, I basically, I wrote this book for my blog readers. I wrote it for the kind of people who can never get enough from NASA websites. But I'll tell you, the people who I was really thinking of when I wrote this book were the poor, hapless first and second year grad students who are coming onto the mission really late and are like, what, what the heck is going on? They have no idea. That's just, it's overwhelming. And it is overwhelming. There's no one person who knows everything. Right. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, it's coming out soon. Very, very soon. It. When does it actually, is it uh, June 11th with Amazon? I would like to be able to tell you what the release <laughs> date is, but Springer has not been able to tell me precisely. Um, it could be any day. Like I actually got an email this morning from Springer saying the ebook is available and I went straight to their website and I tried to put it in my cart and it wouldn't go into my cart. And so <laughs> they're looking into the problem, but it could be any time between now and early May, I think. Yeah, and that's actually really cool. I went to Pasadena, uh, JPL, so JPL in Pasadena, uh, recently and stood next to the model of it. I had no idea yeah. that Curiosity was that big. It is really tall. It's uh, 1.9 meters tall at eye level, which is taller than just about anybody except Shaq. So yeah, it's tall. It's pretty tall. It was impressive. And the one thing that I've been reading about recently is that it's wheels are, are just, well, I mean, it's been happening over time, obviously, but it's poor wheels, right? Right. So, but it turns out that that was a much bigger problem early in the mission when they didn't know yet that it was going on. And so they rolled into trouble around Sol 400 and they were just tootling along, enjoying their drive and hadn't realized that the rocks into the wheels had turned into something that, that nobody had ever driven on a Mars before. They, they, um, later likened it to shark's teeth embedded in concrete. Oh my God. And so it was just really nasty. And um, But long story short, they figured out what kind of terrain to drive the rover on uh, so so as not to make the, um, the wheels get so many holes in them. And they actually, it's kind of cool story about how they got the science side working very closely with the engineers to kind of plan the path really far and ahead to avoid nasty terrain. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually like a scientist who sits with the engineer on um, on ops every day saying, yeah, that's wheel shreddy, tr shreddy terrain. That's not wheel shreddy terrain. So maybe go over here instead of going straight across. And then they do that. And so the wheels have really been doing a lot better. Uh, obviously they don't heal, but they're not getting as damaged as fast. And the wheels are gonna last as long as the rover does. So we're cool. Yeah, and I watched them actually, they were making the, the new one that's, I don't know when actually that's going up. I, I should know this off the top of my head, but they, I feel like they, there's so much going on with Mars. They call the <laughs> rover Mars 2020 for a reason. <laughs> oh. 
obvious astronomy <laughs> names for the win. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, I saw that actually being made. That was pretty cool. Yes, um, what, what's going to be different about that? Well, actually, let's start with curiosity. Let's sure. just start with curiosity, and then maybe you can tell me what would be different um, for the, the 2020 <laughs> rover. So yeah, so uh, Curiosity has 17 cameras. It's got 10 science instruments. Um, it's got, uh, it's about two meters tall. It's got uh, two laboratory instruments inside its belly. It's got a freaking laser beam on its head. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, the 2020 Rover will look superficially fairly similar. Um, the wheels are gonna be different. They're not gonna have the same wheel shreddy, shreddy problems that they had before. Um, it will have a different looking turret on the end of its arm because it'll have different instruments down there. Mm -hmm. And it will have a drill, like a core device that actually drills into a rock and pulls out a rock core. Um, and then a lot of the science instruments are quite different. So like the two instruments that are in the belly are very different. One of them is actually this giant carousel that's designed to handle those rock cores and put them into these little sample carriers that the rover will periodically drop like rover poops along the way. Mm -hmm. And then some future mission is going to be able to pick those things up and return them to Earth as like carefully cataloged science samples. Um, the 2020 rover will not have the adorable two different sized eyes that Curiosity has. It'll have two same size eyes. So that'll mm -hmm. be a big difference. And what does that what um, does that help with? Uh, well, they never wanted to have two different sized eyes in the first place. And actually the story of why it does is kind of long and complicated and probably not really interesting enough ultimately <laughs> for this, for this, uh, but it is, I do tell it in here and, and believe me, it's a page turner part of the story. Um, but it, it comes down to being penny wise and pound foolish on NASA's budget at the time that that decision was made. So, gotcha. um, yeah. So anyway, read my book to find out the answer to that question, but it's not something that the scientists wanted and they'll be much happier to have two same size eyeballs on the next, um, on the next one. Um, but to explain what it means that they're different size, uh, one of them is more zoomed in than the other is. Oh, okay. So like they take photos of something and one of them um, takes, uh, it covers a smaller area but has more pixels. So you can see things in more detail with a smaller eye than you can with the bigger eye. Gotcha. And so that, but that subsurface sampling, uh -huh. that's, that's pretty imperative, right? That's, that's pretty, pretty big. It's, it's very big. It's what, like when you get um, every 10 years, the science community gets together um, and does this something, something called a decadal survey where um, scientists uh, are invited to give input to the national academies about what should our goals for the next 10 years be. And for the, at the very top of Mars scientists goals for the last like three decades has been Mars sample return. And we just haven't done it because it's really difficult and expensive. It's basically three curiosity size missions. You need one to go down and collect the samples. You need a second one to land, pick up, retrieve, and launch the samples. And you need a third to return the samples back to Earth. And so we haven't been able to get the budget from Congress to actually go forward and plan to do that kind of mission. But Mars 2020, um, kind of snuck its way into being the first step on that mission, the gathering the samples. And now we just need to plan two more missions, one to go um, pick them up. It's possible that, that you could do the second and third steps with one mission, but it's, it's going to be expensive and difficult. Yeah. Someone had a good question, though. Let me find it because chat's moving. It's moving pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't even that bad. We've had more... Um... Uh, where, where, will the color or were the cameras on this on this 2020 but will it be will they be colored cameras yes so um like i said there's 17 cameras on curiosity um uh mars 2020 is going to have a same a similar number of cameras but there's two different kinds of cameras on both rovers they have engineering cameras and science cameras the engineering cameras are the ones that they use to take like a quick look at what's around them they get like a 360 degree view in stereo so that they can get the lay of the land. Um, and the, for those cameras, because they're just for engineering purposes and all they need to see is the shape of the landscape, they don't need color. So that's why you see a lot of black and white images from Curiosity 
and also the Mars Exploration Rovers, because those cameras don't need color to get the 3D landscape information. And color costs three times as much bandwidth as uh, Grayscale does. Mm -hmm. And so you only take color if you have to. And you do want color for science. So the science cameras, which are on Curiosity, the different size eyeballs, um, and on 2020, it's a camera called MassCam Z, those have full color capability. Not only can they take red, green, blue pictures like the normal uh, normal handheld camera does, but they have infrared filters that let them get information out into longer wavelengths um, of the electromagnetic spectrum, which tells you a little bit about rock composition around you. Yeah. Someone just said, why can't we see the other side of the moon? So I, I can address that later, but that's that's tidal, uh, tidal locking. Um, but I can talk about that later. So... Uh, yeah, so that's so she is that book is going to have a bunch of interesting things, but I wanted her to give us kind of like a, a an idea of some of the things that while writing it, she was like, wow, I, I mean, what were some things that you that kind of blew your mind as far as uh, curiosity goes? You know, I have to say that the thing that blew my mind the most is that there is a, a random piece of hardware, a flow regulator. It's just, you know, it's, it's something that it's like a flux capacitor or something. It's a flow regulator that was on the descent stage. So not the rover itself, but the rocket assisted jetpack that the rover used to land. Um, the flow regulator was recycled from the space shuttle program. So it actually had launched as part of space shuttle discovery several times and come back to earth several times. And then they, after the shuttle program ended, they needed this high capacity flow regulator for the Mars mission. And hey, look, they got a used one off the shelf from, from shuttle. And they refurbished it and they put it into the descent stage and flew Curiosity to Mars and slammed that thing into the Martian surface. So this piece of shuttle is now, it actually blew up the, the because there was um, uh, fuel left in the descent stage um, gas tanks when they landed and the thing just exploded. And so now there's this thing from the shuttle program that's sitting on the surface of Mars. I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, no, people are saying recycling, yes. And now that- Recycling, it, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, someone just goes, now that's cool. That is yeah. cool, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so wait, let's see. So with all the new computer advancements, will the bandwidth be better or do we still have the mm -hmm. same like 50 years ago? That's. Yeah, so it's not computers that are the limitation there. You have, there's two things that limit you. One is um, the power you have to broadcast and using power for communications, it's actually one of the bigger power expenditures on any space mission. So you have to generate enough power. Curiosity, I've, got, I've actually got a little Lego model of Curiosity here on my desk, I can show it to you. <laughs> Which I love. Isn't it cute? <laughs> so, so Curiosity, um, this was an actual Lego set, by the way, that you can buy. Um, Curiosity is powered by this thing called a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Or Write MNRTG. that down for your dates. That's what yes, I always right. say whenever you throw something complex <laughs> out there. Write that down. Yeah. So, so this thing, um, it's nuclear powered, right? But all that nuclear power does, it's basically just a pile of plutonium decaying and creating heat. And thermocouples turn that heat into electricity. Um, and it's not a very efficient process. It only turns like, I forget what percent, but it's like small. It's like 3% of the, of the heat gets turned into electricity. The rest is, rest is wasted, is waste heat. And so this thing actually only generates about 100 watts. So think about a 100 watt light bulb. That's how much power this rover runs on. And it's actually not enough power to keep the rover awake all the time. The rover actually, it's like a cat. It sleeps most of the day. It's only awake for about five or six hours a day because all the rest of that time, the um, RTG is just trickling power into its lithium batteries to recharge it. And so um, using the bigger your dish, uh, the more power you have to use for transmission. And Curiosity, um, Curiosity can transmit direct to Earth with a, this is pretty close to scale, a little tiny dish up here. Um, but most of the time it uses a um, cylindrical ultra high frequency antenna to communicate with orbiters overhead when the orbiters relay things to Earth. And so that's one way that we get around this transmission problem of needing a great big dish and a lot of power to run it is that Curiosity only has to send it as far as one of the orbiters hits overhead. But then the other um, limitation is the deep space network, which is where NASA gets all of its data down to Earth. It's these beautiful dishes in California and um, Australia and Spain. 
And there's only so many dishes, dishes, and there is a ton of deep space missions. And NASA actually works with other space agencies to help them get data down as well. And that's that's the real limitation. And we have not been investing enough money to expand um, and extend our deep space network. There's a real good article written recently by Shannon Sterone about the, the problems going on with the deep space network. And so, a lot of missions are really fighting for bandwidth. And it's kind of a shame, really. You build these expensive missions and send them out there, and they're limited in part by how much data they can return to Earth. And sending more missions is actually going to cause us bigger problems because they won't, um, there won't be expanded capacity on the ground to support it. Right, yeah, and that's actually one of the questions. So staying right on top of that, someone said, uh, can I ask Emily a question? How does our space center control probes? Because there's always communication delay between Earth and Mars. And any, right. any like Juno, Cassini, well, not Cassini anymore, but yeah. Yeah, so these robots are semi-autonomous. So basically what you do is you build a command sequence for them that <clears throat> that controls all of the aspects of, of everything that the space spaceship does. And it... A command sequence runs for a fixed period. So for Curiosity, the command sequence typically covers one sol, one Martian day. And through this high gain antenna, it gets, it receives an uplink from Earth once a day at about 10 a.m. local solar time on Mars. Um, we send this command load and it spends the day executing those commands and then um, it'll use its afternoon passes to relay data back to Earth and then the next morning, it waits patiently to get its its next command load from from Earth. So about once a sol, uh, side of the mission, the tactical mission team on Earth generates a new command load, a new command sequence that it uplinks to Mars, and the rover executes it. There are some times that the that Earth generates a multi sol sequence. So it, like for instance, nowadays the mission's been gone on long enough that they um, that the tactical team doesn't work over weekends. They let people have a little time off, and so they build three-day sequences every Friday and they execute those on the weekends. Um, other missions like New Horizons or Juno or something, they'll have command loads that that cover many more days, usually maybe a, a week or even more at a time, and so. Um, so there's like one big uplink, they check and verify the uplink and then they switch over to the new sequence and the spacecraft runs it. And it, the spacecraft will follow all the commands, but it also has a lot of onboard intelligence to keep it safe. So if executing a command causes some kind of dangerous condition, then the spacecraft has all kinds of, of little watchdog programs that make sure that it's not too hot, that its batteries aren't too low, that it doesn't have all these kinds of other problems. And if it runs into one of those problems, it'll autonomously quit the running command sequence and go into something called safe mode, where it kind of hunkers down. It, uh, If you're a deep space spacecraft, it turns its solar panels to face at the sun, so it's getting maximum recharge. And it turns on its dish periodically to listen for instructions from Earth. And it'll send a little distress signal saying, hey, something's not right. I, I'm not going to do any more work until you send me further instructions. And safe mode scares a lot of people. We hear about safe mode happening all the time. Yeah, it's it's not scary. It's a spacecraft being conservative and taking care of itself. Because the one thing you can't do in space missions is talk to a spacecraft that is not talking to you. That's the scariest thing. It's really difficult if you lose contact with a spacecraft. So they have all of these watchdogs set very conservatively. They don't want anything going even slightly wrong. So if anything goes a little bit out of bounds, then the spacecraft will autonomously safe itself. And safe mode is that, it's safe. It's a safe condition for the spacecraft to be in. It irritates people because um, it means that it's not doing science. And it could have been in the middle of doing something really cool when it went into safe mode. And so um, it's a pain, but it means that the spacecraft is acting properly and the scientists uh, or, or the engineers on Earth will act quickly to figure out what triggered it and whether it's really a problem or whether it's not. And, and they'll, they'll work pretty quickly to get a spacecraft out of safe mode. Yeah, there you go. I'm, <laughs> let's see. Wait, why is the deep space network not being upgraded? Isn't that short-sighted? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, you are correct. It's short-sighted. It's a lot like freeway bridges, right? I mean, we keep hearing about how our, how our interstate bridges are just about to collapse. And yeah, that's short-sighted too. It's It would really be a pain if bridges fell. 
And it's the same with, with the Deep Space Network. Now, I know a lot of people who work at the Deep Space Network and they are amazing people and they're doing what they can with the with their declining budgets to, to make the most of every data bit that comes down from the spacecraft. You have no idea how dedicated these people are to getting all that data safely on the ground. Um, but it would be nice if they got thrown a few more million dollars from, um, from headquarters to do this necessary upgrades and maintenance to their hardware. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a big, big part of a lot of this. That's why we, uh, there's a little and, bit of know, a... <laughs> we at the Planetary Society are uh, highly into getting people to contact their representatives and say, hey, you know, please, we like space. We like data from space. Why don't you throw some money at the Deep Space Network? Make, make us all a little happier with all the cool data coming down from, from different planets. Yeah, as, yeah, because we also have the Juno mission going on too. And that's yep. very, very interesting one. Um, I mean, there's so many, and then there's ones upcoming too. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not even listing, like even, I'm not even scratching the surface of what's already out there. So someone said, I have a question for Emily. Is there any cybersecurity, for instance, a lot of encryption for the rovers and probes in space on Mars, in orbit around Mars? I don't know for sure. I mean, obviously there has to be, okay. I mean, obviously they have some amount of security, um, I did read, I think, in a um, like some uh, audit, some uh, congressional audit, that there is some concern about um, whether the security is enough at some of these centers. But um, as far as I know, <laughs> you know, knock on wood, there has not been any attempt to hijack one of these spacecraft. The thing is that, like. Um, it's not like you can, you know, take over the rover and drive it off a cliff. Like you have to have the right sequence of commands. And so I think the worst thing that, that anybody's most likely to, to do is just to make it idle, which would be very bad for scientists. And it would be um, a big waste of money. But um, I don't think that we have to worry about the physical safety of the rover. Um, but it's, I mean, obviously, this day and age, everything is a concern. There's people out there who want to hack into everything and grief things. And it's just, it's uncool. And I wish people would stop. But but I do know that there are people who, who think about this every day. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm reading the rest of the comments. Um, why don't we go to Europa? Yeah. Well, sure. you're, okay, so we can start talking about a little bit about that. Because, again, she is a planetary geologist. So these kind of things, obviously, are going to be on her radar as well. Yep. So do you want to talk about Europa? Give us some insight on Europa. I talk about it, but I, I would like to hear from a geologist, a planetary geologist. Do you have any specific questions or should I just talk about Europa? Well, we can talk about Europa in a whole, just why it's interesting okay. and then why we have the clipper um, sure. coming up. Why, why, why is Europa interesting? Why is Europa interesting? Okay, so Jupiter has four big moons. Um, and sometimes I feel kind of bad for Ganymede and um, Callisto that they don't get talked about as much as Europa does. Um, Io is a funny case. Io is the volcanic moon, and it's really super interesting. Um, but it's not one of these icy moons like uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are. So we think, wow, that is a. That I know. Is not, I, oh, I, I know. I always Europa. go to the. I go to the asteroid. <laughs> I Sorry. always do that, and I'm like, wait, that's not what I'm at all that's trying to Europa. do. <laughs> okay. Um, the IAU avoids that problem, by the way. Now there's, I think there's very few objects that have the same name. Good. Europa that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so Europa is actually the smallest of Jupiter's big moons. Um, like Ganymede and Callisto, it's made of ice and rock and metal. Um, it's relatively dense. It's actually, I think, the second densest of Jupiter's big moons. Um, we know that Europa and Ganymede and Callisto all have oceans underneath their ice, liquid water oceans. And you can tell that because when you fly a spacecraft past them, you can detect an induced magnetic field coming out of the moon because there's salt in that water. And when you move a conductive fluid through a magnetic field, and Jupiter has a huge magnetic field, then you can induce a current in it and create another magnetic field. So you can you can detect oceans on these other worlds. So why do we why Europa in particular? If Ganymede and Callisto also have oceans, why do we care about Europa? And there's two reasons. One of them is that Europa has a very youthful surface. It has hardly any craters on it. And craters are a tool that geologists use to figure out how old a surface in the solar system is. If there's a ton of craters on the surface, then the surface hasn't aged very much. It, it, uh, 
I mean, sorry, if there's a ton of craters on the surface, that means the surface has been exposed to asteroid impact for a very long time. So like if you look at a place like the moon, that surface has been exposed to asteroid impact for more than three and a half million years. That's why there's so many craters on it. The um, Europa, by contrast, is maybe on average 20 to 30 million years old, which is way, way, way younger. It's 100 times younger. It's, it's less than 1% the age of the moon. And it's not really possible to say whether or not it's active today, but given such youthful age, it probably is. So we could probably see some new action happening on Europa's surface at some time in the future. It may not happen very often, um, and so we may never see it, but it's, it could happen again in the future. So we know it's geologically active. That's cool because it means there's geology happening, and geology means heat and things uh, moving inside the subsurface. When you have a heat source and you have fluid, those are two of the three things that you need um, to, to create an environment in which you can imagine life forming. The last thing you need is chemistry. So you can't just have like plain water with nothing else. But if you have hot volcanic rocks in contact with liquid water, and you've got that liquid water percolating among the rocks, and you've got lots of ions in it, um, you can have lots of interesting chemistry happening. You would imagine an environment like we see in the deep, deep earth at volcanic vents with the black smokers and everything. And there's lots of life in those locations. And so all of those things together makes Europa seem like a pretty good candidate as a place in our solar system that could possibly have life in it. For Ganymede and Callisto, it's not the same because they're, um, they're much larger. They have a lot more ice in proportion to rock. So it turns out that their oceans are perched in between two icy layers. And so the ice, the water doesn't, probably doesn't come into contact with hot rock. Plus Callisto is, the surface is super ancient. Um, and uh, Ganymede is, is a younger surface, but it's also fairly old. So we think that Europa is the best candidate as an environment that could support life. And so that's what makes Europa, of all the moons in the Jupiter system, the most interesting for exploration. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, and so you see these. So talk about these. And so I, I actually talked to Dr. Pamela yesterday. She was on. And I, I called these, you know, what do we call them? Like tiger tiger marks, tiger lines. <laughs> yeah, they're, they call them... Um, they have a lot of different names. You know, scientists like to look at a vast array of natural things and split everything into categories and come up with names. So you have uh, ridges and bands and other kinds of features. I think that most of what we see here are double ridges, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not entirely up on my European nomenclature. Um, but a lot of these things, as you can see, there, there are a double ridges. If you look closely, you can see there's sort of like a, a little gap in the middle and, and two little sort of hills on either side going all the way down the ridges. And um, people think that this may be a place where there's a crack in the ice shell that kind of gets smushed and opened and smushed and opened as Europa gets squeezed as it goes around Jupiter. Because Europa is in a, a resonant orbit with um, Io and Ganymede, mm -hmm. where Io goes around four times for every two times Europa does for every one time Ganymede does. And just like being pushed on a swing and every time, every time the, the moons align in their orbits, it kind of gives an extra tidal squeeze to Europa. And that's what makes Io so volcanically active because it's getting squeezed so much. Yeah. And Europa is a little bit less active, but it's still pretty active. And so that's the source of all of its energy. And there's a lot of squeezing going on. You'll also see, um, actually in the picture that I can see right now on the stream, mm -hmm. there's these cracks that have this kind of bump, ba -dump, ba -dump kind of shape to them. Those are called cycloid cracks. And um, I've seen people uh, do a bunch of physics and s say that those cracks, they open, they develop um, with each as, as Europa goes around its orbit. So each of those bumps is a result of one orbit around Jupiter with the stresses changing as Europa rotates and the moons move around and stuff. These ones? So, and, and you'll probably see me trying to yep, highlight yep, them. I, yeah. I've never so, even noticed that. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. There's a lot of neat physics in the ice shells of these uh, of these moons. Uh, geophysicists absolutely love them. They're just, there's so much fun stuff they can do. And that brings me to another question where someone said, uh, and this is this is good because these are two. Uh, why my question is why is someone said liquid bread said this. My question is why is it much more expensive looking for life in obvious places instead of looking for life 
on a dry, dusty planet like <laughs> Mars? Yeah. Well, um, the, there's a number of reasons. Uh, the farther you go from the sun, the more difficult your mission is by any num for any number of reasons. One, it's just harder to get there. You need a bigger rocket. Um, farther from the sun means that it's harder to use solar power. Juno's the, the first mission to go to Jupiter running on solar power. And its solar panels are freaking huge. And it's hard to keep them running because Jupiter also has a nasty magnetic field. It's a really horrible environment to be in. And Europa's right in the middle of it. So you have to build these big, huge spacecraft with huge electronic components sealed inside vaults of lead or other heavy materials in order to shield it from all the energetic particles that are flying around. Um, there's uh, people want to land on Europa. We've never landed on an icy moon before. And while we know, we're gonna know from Clipper what the surface of Europa looks like down to some resolution. But when you think about a lander is usually a pretty small thing, one, maybe two meters at most. And th that ice that's been squeezed and cracked so much could have all kinds of nasty shapes. Google a feature called penitentes. These are these weird ice knives that form in high altitudes on Earth that would just be, I, I wouldn't imagine wanting to land a spacecraft on it. And there's just so little we know about what the environment is that it's just gonna be hard to develop a mission. We need more reconnaissance first. So Mars, we know so well, it's a lot easier to develop missions to go to Mars. It's Mars and the moon and asteroids are kind of low hanging fruit, if anything can be in terms of planetary exploration because we know them really well. Hmm. Yeah, no, I just looked that up here and I, I'm getting them uh, on, I'm gonna send that link into chat of what those are so that people can see what you're talking about as far as that surface structure goes. Uh, that's interesting, I've not looked at those before. And of course, it's like, I don't understand this word. This is bad spelling. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got that right. Um, so so as far as uh, what's the difference really between Europa then and Enceladus? So Enceladus is, is interesting. So Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. It's mm -hmm. actually a pretty small moon. Um, it's about the size of Texas. Um, it's got, uh, it's an icy moon you wouldn't expect such a tiny moon to be active. In fact, the moon next door, Mimas, is heavily cratered and looks like you would expect a world that size to look like. But Enceladus has these really fresh surfaces. You can see that it's only cratered near the North Pole. And as you go down to, to more into the South, you see it's got all these linear features on it, which kind of reminds you of Europa. It's a little lumpier because it's so much smaller and the gravity is a lot lower. And um, you're actually looking at, so- uh, I'm kind of moving it around. Pole. Yeah, you're moving it around. The cratered part is the North Pole and the, the tiger stripes, which are those colorful sets of lines that are parallel to each other are right at the South Pole. Okay. And Cassini found that out of those tiger stripes are coming these gigantic geysers. And by flying through the, the geysers, um, Cassini was able to scoop up some of it with a instrument called the ion and neutral mass spectrometer and was able to taste what was in um, those plumes. And it found that Enceladus is spilling a saltwater ocean into space. There's salts, there's little bits of um, silicate particles, which to, it's, it's the, all the same story. You've got a geologically active world with a subsurface ocean that's in contact with hot rock. And the difference between Enceladus and Europa is that Enceladus is very kindly spewing its ocean into space. So instead of having to land on the surface, you could instead send a spacecraft that would just fly through the plume and you could even do sample collection and sample return. You could send a spacecraft like the Stardust spacecraft that we sent to a comet a decade ago, fly it through the Enceladus plume, scoop up some of the particles and return them to earth where we could actually investigate them in the laboratory. And that would be way easier than landing on Europa. Even though it's farther away, um, anytime you can get away with a flyby instead of a um, instead of a landing, it's a much easier mission. And so that mission is a really attractive one for future um, outer planet study. Is there any other missions you're looking forward to in particular with your research and what you know? Well, so I came into planetary science studying Venus, and I've always, and uh, Venus was last visited with a geology mission by Magellan in the mid-90s. 
Um, since then, there have been a couple of other missions that have focused on the upper atmosphere, but I'm a geologist. I don't care about the atmosphere. The atmosphere is just the thing I want to blow away so I can see the rocks. And there hasn't been a new um, Venus mission for a long time. So I'd really like to see a new mission that actually gets below the clouds and is able to see the surface of Venus. The other thing I really want to see is you know, what inspired me to get into planetary science or to be interested in it as a very little kid probably was the Voyager 2 exploration of all the outer planets. And we've returned to Jupiter, we've returned to Saturn and with orbiters, but we've never returned to Uranus or Neptune to orbit them and to understand those worlds better and to see their moons up close. And they're you know, recently we've been discovering exoplanets around lots and lots of other stars. And the majority of exoplanets that we've discovered are the size of Uranus and Neptune. And the fact is that we don't understand these worlds in our own solar system very well. And so how are we going to understand them in other solar systems? So we really got to send a mission. Or my, my dream is to have um, two identical spacecraft, or nearly identical, that launch around the same time, one going to Uranus, one going to Neptune, both going into orbit so we can compare the two um, and they'd both be there in the 2040s, which is when both planets will go through equinox, which means we'll be able to see both poles of um, the planets and all their moons. And that would be really nifty. Yeah. And, and you're, everybody's like, this music, I know that the, I have some Hans Zimmer going in the background. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and so then, so people like are like, well, if you could have only one, most scientists would pick Neptune because um, Neptune has a big moon called Triton that's yes. probably a captured Kuiper Belt object, which, and if it were in the Kuiper Belt, it would be the biggest Kuiper Belt object. It's bit, bigger than Pluto. Mm. And while I understand that argument, I like Uranus better because it has more moons and I love all the icy moons. Plus, if we sent a mission to orbit and probe Uranus, you know that it would be on TV every single day. People would be so into it. Conan or Jimmy Fallon or whoever would just mention it in their monologues every day because how could they not? And right. That would just be so awesome for space science. So exactly. I'm, yeah, you guys didn't. Go, I noticed. I totally noticed that you said Uranus, and then did that. That was perfect. I don't know if you yeah. even chat. See, chat told you space just yeah. gives this to us. Yes, it does. <laughs> That's right. And we have to keep a straight face. Yep. I used to teach um, fifth graders about space, and oh, I man. assigned every kid a planet that they had to do a project on. So of course, like. Uh, I had to pull one kid aside. Usually it was like the class clown. I'd be like, you know, so have I got a planet for you? <laughs> and so, but I would like bargain. I wouldn't just like give Uranus to a random kid. I would have like that com that conversation with the kid beforehand to make sure they were okay with it. <laughs> the other thing I used to do is I would write on the board, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E space A space N-U-S-S. And I would make all my fifth graders turn to each other and accuse each other of being a nuss <laughs> so that it's, you know, it's, it's silly, but it, it kind of gets a different, um, it just gives a different mental model for what that word means and allows them to be able to have a normal conversation in the classroom right. without constantly get giggling. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's fun to make stupid jokes about Uranus. I think then you will see like science writers doing it all the time. Oh yeah. But I, you don't want it to derail your um, ability to actually um, have a, an educational conversation about the planet. Right. Which that planet's super weird because it's tilted on its side. Yeah. It's a really cool planet and it's got this um it's got this reputation of being dull because Voyager 2 flew past it at solstice when one pole was pointed at the sun all the time and that kind of shut down all the weather on Uranus. So it was just like this featureless blue ball. But now you can see it from um uh, telescopes on Earth, and from a distance, it doesn't look so different from Neptune anymore. There are clouds on it, just like Neptune has, both bright clouds and dark spots on Uranus. Ha ha ha! There's they like seriously <laughs> like I this. Know that, Wait, that yeah. I, I think that's actually showing one. Yeah, I've never yeah, even so. noticed that before yeah. on on in this game at least or in the simulation. Yeah. Weird. And um. You know, Neptune's great dark spot is not like Jupiter's great red spot. The great dark spot that Voyager 2 saw in Neptune has gone away and reappeared again a couple times. Um, then we can tell that with big telescopes pointed at these worlds from Earth. But um, the images that we have, particularly of Uranus's moons, like 
all except Miranda, we have pictures of these moons that are like 200 pixels across. And that's the best we got from Voyager. And I'm just dying to go back to those moons and see what they actually look like. Yeah, from what I understand, you know, they, they thought as they were approaching it with the Voyager, that it looked pretty boring. And then when they saw it backlit to the sun and they actually got to see those rings. Yeah. That's when everybody was like, okay, hold on a minute. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, they also saw Miranda. I don't know if you can point your simulation at Miranda yeah. there, but Miranda is a super cool moon. Miranda is cool. It, it's the same size as Enceladus and Mimas. Um, and it's got this really weird structure, this kind of uh, split personality. It reminds me of Two-Face, uh, where you know one part of it is kind of ordinary looking, and then it's got these what are called chevrons, these features that kind of rip across its surface. So um, it used to be, the books that I read when I was growing up would say it looked like the moon had been smashed and reassembled. And we actually, scientists don't think that anymore. They think that it probably, this is a moon that started doing what Enceladus did a long time ago, but it's not doing that anymore. Um, because it's just, it's, it's cold and it froze before Enceladus did. And so now it's kind of caught in the act of becoming an Enceladus-like world, but then it froze. The particular picture that you're looking at right now is particularly two-faced because um, Voyager only saw the south poles of all of Uranus's moons because mm -hmm. the north poles were in darkness. So the north pole, the the one half of the Miranda that you're looking at is completely made up, completely simulated. Mm -hmm. And the lumpy half is the part that we actually know something about from Voyager. Oh, wow. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so all this, uh, the, the interesting stuff that everybody's like, okay, that's pretty sweet. Everybody's thinking that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. It's wacky. Uh, where's the planet that's a solid diamond? So you're talking about, uh, yeah. That's okay. Uranus or Neptune. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that people are theorizing, you know, Uranus and Neptune, they're often, uh, classified with Saturn and Jupiter, but they're really very different. Saturn and Jupiter have a lot of hydrogen and helium in them. Their composition is pretty similar to the sun, but, um, uh, Neptune and Uranus don't have all that hydrogen. They have some, but they don't have nearly as much. There's a lot more uh, water and methane and um, sulfur compounds and what are called, uh, they're all volatiles. They're all, tech, you know, in our part of the solar system, they'd be gas, but they're actually liquids or even ices at um, uh, Neptune and Uranus's distance from the sun. So they're called ice giants instead of gas giants. And so probably you have a pretty thin envelope of gas on the outside, and then it goes uh, into liquid or solid state pretty pretty close to the, the visible surface. And so what happens if you take a carbon containing compound like methane and you press it under very high pressure, what happens is that you cause chemical reactions, you make crystals and all that carbon will be pressured into diamonds. So it's it's quite likely that it actually does rain diamonds on these ice giant moons. Yeah. I mean, on these ice giant uh, atmospheres. <laughs> Planets and everything. Yeah, a, a lot of methane coming out. Oh, yes. Okay. Um. <laughs> yes, Uranus has methane coming out, blah, blah, blah. All right. I it's am, not it's, a new joke. <laughs> I know. I, I hear it all the time. And I, when I go yeah. to talk about how it's, you know, tilted on its side, tilted means something here. And Twitch, that's pretty funny. So there's, there's like so many... <laughs> things of where it, you know, I'm like, yeah, guys, Uranus is tilted. And also its seasons are really weird. And um, I got your wedding ring, ring from right. Uh, but yes. So so as far as uh, can you talk a little bit about you started to go into Triton. Uh, Triton's actually oh, yeah. really cool because of its nitrogen geysers. Yeah. Yeah. So Triton, um, Triton is a really strange moon. It orbits Neptune uh, backwards with respect to the direction that Neptune rotates. And moons just, you can't, physics doesn't work that way. You can't form moons that way. So um, it's a pretty good indication that Triton didn't form with Neptune, that Triton's an interloper. And um, another good clue to that is the fact that Neptune doesn't have any other big moons. The next biggest moon is, uh, what's it called? It's called Proteus, I think. And it's about 400 kilometers across. It's smaller than Minus. Um, and so it's a, that's a good indication that probably sometime in the past, um, Triton came flying past the system, was captured into orbit around Neptune. But as part of that process, it disturbed the orbits of all the other moons that would have been there at the time. And they either got eaten by Neptune or flung off into other parts of the solar system, most likely eaten by Neptune. Mm -hmm. And so Triton's the only thing that's left. 
And uh, it's big, it's 2,700 kilometers across. That makes it a bit, quite a bit bigger than Pluto. Pluto is about 2,400 kilometers across. And it's got this funky surface. It's got what's known as cantaloupe terrain. If you zoom in on it, you can see it really does look exactly like a cantaloupe. And then um, that's around like the equator. And then down at the poles where it was also summer at, at one of the poles of um, Triton when Voyager 2 flew, flew past, there are these um, black smoking geysers. They're not like the geysers on Enceladus. Um, they're much smaller. And what scientists think is happening is that at the surface of Triton, there is this ice deposit of clear nitrogen ice and that the sun can shine through the nitrogen ice so that heat is getting through and is actually sublimating some of the gas under the ice and it's building up this great big gas pressure under the ice. And then um, eventually a crack will form because of all the pressure and a geyser you know, jets up. This is kind of the same kind of thing that drives geysers on Earth when heat um, turns water into steam and makes it blast out of the ground. And the dark stuff is dust, carbonaceous material, other things that are entrained in the in the jet as it as it spews out of the crack. And so these these jets are only at the pole. Mm -hmm. um, they probably move around during the course of seasons. You know, all these places we've only seen once, just the one time that that Voyager two flew past. And it would be so wonderful to go back and watch seasonal change and see how they how they vary. You know, I'll bet you. Triton looks a little different now than it did when Voyager 2 flew past it, although the season has changed really slowly on Neptune. Yeah. And and you can can you describe also why we're kind of seeing, because I know it's here for a reason, so I'm asking a question I already know the answer to, but I want people to hear it from you, why it has this glossy appearance. Oh, well, it's all covered with ice. All the moons in the outer solar system are icy. Um and when scientists say ice, they mean any volatile material, any material that's that's sort of gassy at normal Earth temperatures and pressures, um, that that freezes at at these conditions in the outer solar system. So water is the most common kind of ice, but there's lots of other kinds of ice. There's nitrogen ice. There's carbon dioxide ice. That's dry ice. Um, that that actually exists on Mars, by the way. Mars is cold enough to have carbon dioxide ice. Um, there's uh, carbon monoxide ice, there's nitrogen, there's sulfur, there's some kind of sulfur compound. I don't know if it's sulfur dioxide or what. Um, there's methane ice. Pluto has all of these and um, they all have different rheologies. A rheology means how it behaves um, under stress. And some of them um, are able to flow more easily. Some of them are more brittle, they crack. And so they have all different kinds of behaviors on the surface. As you change the seasons, as you change the temperature, um, each one will behave in a slightly different way and make pretty complicated weather and geology because they, they're they crystals when they're on the surface, so they behave just like water um, when it's ice is technically it's a rock. Um, you know, on these worlds, the ice is both uh, atmosphere and also the kind of the rock that's on the surface. And mm -hmm. so it does things that rocks do on Earth. Yeah, and that's uh, well. Someone just I think I think we just addressed that because that's super interesting. That that some of these planets they do have them modeled, and they they look very uh, like their surface might be that reflective. And I, I would think that this one definitely would, right? Kind of smoothed well, out a might, little bit, or it might not, because you know it's got an atmosphere, and so um, it's a very thin atmosphere, but it does, yeah. and it has material that's spewing up and landing. So it might not actually be that shiny. It might have, um, it might be crystalline. You know, it'll have like hoarfrost on the surface, or something like that. Like they don't generally, if you look at a photo of them, they don't reflect in in quite that way. Mm -hmm. There's one place in the solar system that does, uh, and but it's a little hard to see because it has a very hazy atmosphere, and that's Titan, because Titan actually has liquid methane and ethane lakes on its surface. And the VIMS instrument on Cassini actually did experiments where they looked at Titan with the sun like up here and they found the specular reflection, mm -hmm. the mirror reflection from the lakes. And so there are some really cool pictures that show that specular reflection off of Titan lakes captured by Cassini. It was only visible to the VIMS instrument because you had to see in infrared at like wavelengths of one or two microns. It's quite a bit longer wavelength than human eyes can see. Um, in order to see through the atmosphere and be able to to see that specular reflection coming off the lakes. Yeah, because Titan's got pretty thick atmosphere. It has a very thick atmosphere. Although it's, I mean, it's not 
it, it it's optically thick. It looks thick. It's right. easy. It's it's a it's a nasty smoggy day in Beijing or what uh, what Los Angeles used to look like before the um, Southern California Air Quality Management Management District, which is a, a word a phrase that I know from my days as an environmental consultant. But yeah, um, uh, Titan has a mostly nitrogen atmosphere, just like we do. But there's a small amount of methane in it, and when ultraviolet light from the sun hits the methane, it knocks the hydrogen off, and then you can combine a couple of those things to make ethane. And then this process repeats itself and repeats itself, and you get longer and longer hydrocarbon uh, gunk, basically, forming in the atmosphere. And that stuff is very optically opaque. Eventually, it rains down to the surface, but uh, it's what makes um, it's what makes it hard to see through Titan's atmosphere. Gotcha. Yeah, I think it, it's not going to render everything, but we just, we, we landed on Titan. I know that That's it cool. does, <laughs> I know it, it, they do have areas where it does show the lakes. Um, yeah, you have to, so the lakes are only at the poles. Um, Titan is pretty dry and desert-like everywhere except right at the poles. And right now, most of the lakes are wet at the North Pole. Um, and Cassini scientists aren't 100% sure why the North Pole is wetter than the South Pole. There's some topographic stuff involved. There's some stuff about how the seasons are a little different in the north and the south because of the orbit not being quite um, circular. But uh, it's, it's one of those things that's going to be, um, uh, it'll help if we can have more missions that'll study the lakes over a longer period. Absolutely. I know we had a uh, doctor, I think it was Jason Barnes on here who, who did uh -huh. some work. Oh yeah, he's a Titan guy. Yeah, no, he was great. He was wonderful. Um, and and so, so out of, since someone asked, and I know that you kind of already kind of sort of answered it, but just to ask it again for the people that are coming in now, what is, what is your favorite planet or um, moon in our solar system that you've, you've enjoyed studying? You know, asking for my favorite planet is like asking for my favorite missions, like asking for my favorite child. <laughs> the planet that I'm looking at right now is the one that I'm most interested in. Um, I think I've always loved the icy moons because they were just so surprising. Like you expected them all to look alike and yet each one is a unique world. And so it's really cool that all the moons are, are so different. Um, I think I like the, uh, the Kuiper Belt objects that are not Pluto, that we don't have any plans to explore right now. And we know that they're colorful and they're large and they're round and they've probably had geologic history happen to them, but we have no idea what they look like. So they're these lands of boundless possibility right now. I also like the really tiny worlds that we explore. Like we haven't talked about Comet churyumov gerasimenko yet, which is the, the comet that was visited by European Space Agency Rosetta spacecraft. And it looks like a rubber duck. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's a cool one. So, How do I start spelling that one? Uh, see if you can put in 67P, 67P, and if it'll come up, because that's the comet's designation. Yep. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a super cool one. And um, the Hi Japanese Hayabusa mission visited this co this uh, asteroid called Itokawa, which they thought looked like a sea otter, which was very typically cute in Japanese, very kawaii. Um, but you have an so, yeah. asteroid named after you. I do. I have asteroid. I don't even remember the number. It's six digits, but it's <laughs> Emily Lakdawalla. So yeah, I have a small asteroid named after me, which is the ultimate honor to receive when you're in space science. I wonder if they have it in here. I bet they. Well, don't. they. I don't know. I know. <laughs> there wouldn't be a picture of it, so it'd be totally made up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's pretty sweet. It she, is pretty neat. She has. She has an asteroid named after her. If you guys don't know this. <laughs> Um, so I hope that, uh, hope this one doesn't wipe out earth on, on life. This, this asteroid. Yeah. No, it's a main belt asteroid. It's never getting anywhere close to earth. Yeah. We only have to worry about things that are called potentially hazardous asteroids, which are earth crossers. The ones whose orbits get them very close to earth. There's Every... not very many of those. Yeah. People are, are asking like, this doesn't look like a, a rubber duck. Yeah. It's in a certain way that you look at it. It's an orientation of it. No, it's not. It's not that this is not a good model yeah. that you're looking at. It's I'm not, not even uh, seeing it at all right now. So this is like, I can't even really demonstrate yeah. that. But if you look but at I'll pictures, I'll do a picture for, real quick. Yeah. And you can, I can add it in the chat. I have a whole image library full of pictures. This seems like a real good time to plug my, um, my website, planetary.org, where you can find all kinds of amazing photos and news stories and everything. 
um, let me find you comment Churyumov Gerasimenka. Here, I'm going to drop the link into the chat. It might say no, no. Wait, hold on. Let me. Oh. What's your what's your oh. hand? Yeah, it will be like. Do, are you it'll logged be, in? It'll be a pain. No, I'm not logged in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to email it to you, and you can. Okay, yeah, because I'll show it after. Yeah. So there you go. There's a link to our image library, um, specifically looking at all the pictures I have of Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko, including some really cool animations because Rosetta orbited the comet. And so it stayed there for a really long time and took all kinds of amazing photos. It was, it was quite a mission. Yeah, and I mean, there was also another, there was a problem that happened, right? Well, uh, the Rosetta mission actually had, uh, was remarkably problem free. The issue came with its filet lander, right. which was this tiny little lander bolted to the side. Um, and during the landing, there were three different things that were supposed to help the lander stick to the surface and none of the three things worked. And so it wound up bouncing. And so the, the lander mission didn't quite work as they expected it to, but that was just like one of the 14 instruments on Rosetta and, and all the orbiters instruments worked beautifully. And that spacecraft has just really changed our understanding of comets and how they change over time. And the fact that they were able to find it Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the comet, it's not a big object, It's but it's it was really hard to find that that little lander, but they did eventually find it. Yeah, they did. Um, old Dirty, not anymore. Uh, let's see. So this one says, uh, is, so is there a team who studies and watches impacts and close calls for Mars? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So there are um, there are groups of people who there's there's actually now automated survey telescopes that are scanning the sky all the time trying to see, trying to discover new potentially hazardous asteroids. And then the automated telescopes will flag these new objects and then astronomers will go and follow them up. And there's actually a lot of work in this being done by amateur astronomers. And so there's these organizations will pull out, put out lists of here are all the things we spotted that might potentially be asteroids passing close to Earth. Um, please go look for them. And then, you know, the more observations of them that you do, the more um, precisely you'll know the orbit. And in almost all cases, the more precisely that you know the orbit, the less likely it's going to impact us because you find that its orbit is taking it on a path. It's actually, impacts are very unlikely. They don't happen very often. And so the only thing you're really worried about is something bigger than about five meters that will come and may do a little bit of damage. The, the hard part is that we can't really reliably detect the smallest of these things. So with all our surveys and all the follow-up that's being done by a lot of people, we have successfully, we think, discovered basically every big object that could, could produce a life-ending disaster or a civilization-ending disaster or a continent-ending disaster. Um, what we haven't managed to find are the ones that are like city-ending disasters. So, you know, good news for civilization, but there could still be some asteroids out there that have, I don't know, Buenos Aires name on it. And so, there's still a lot of work to be done to find these things, um, but it's also now getting down to where there's political work to be done about what's the world's res response going to be. Let's suppose that the United States discovers an asteroid that might hit uh, the U.S. and we could send a mission to it that might deflect it you know, to the north or the south of us. So it definitely won't hit the U.S., but it could hit <laughs> Brazil. You know, wow. would that be, yeah, like, <laughs> clearly that is not the outcome that Brazil wants. And Yikes. So, yeah, so we have to, like, there's there's actually as much political work to do now as there is scientific work on how to deal with potentially hazardous impacts. We actually also don't currently have technology to deflect asteroids. There's a ton of ideas. We just haven't tested it yet. And so that's something the Planetary Society is working on, is trying to develop technologies and actually see them tested for um altering asteroid orbits. And if you know about a potentially hazardous asteroid long enough in advance, like if you have 50 years before it impacts, then you can just make a teeny tiny adjustment to its orbit by using a little gravity tug to, to make it, which is a gravity tug sounds like a tractor beam or something, but no, it's just having a heavy spacecraft located close to the asteroid. And it just changes its gravity just enough that instead of hitting Earth, it might you know miss it by, by a few 
100 kilometers and that would be enough that's all you have to do and so there's lots of different kinds of technologies that we could use and we just need to test them and, and learn about how to use them and learn about what the hazards are and whether we might actually make things worse if we haven't worked out how to do this really well yeah and and someone so the person i asked us asked that question was talking about or asked about mars but that's good because i know you were talking about earth right Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I was talking about her. Yeah. yeah, so so with so guys, that's good. Like for everybody, that's like, did you hear about this asteroid? I'm like, guys, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, and there's um, <laughs> there's a group at JPL, um, the Near Earth Object Program at JPL, that does a really fabulous job of public communication around any potential hazards. They have a list on their website of all of the asteroids that have even the most microscopic chance of hitting Earth at some distant date in the future. And every time something is new, something new is discovered that might pass close, that astronomers have any concern about, they communicate about it very quickly. Because the thing about asteroids is that if they can be seen by a survey, they can be seen by people around the world with telescopes. And so it, you can't keep something like that a secret because it's up there visible in the sky for people to see it. And there are these international collaborative or organizations that it's not like a an organization with a leader it's just a bunch of people who have telescopes who like looking at things in the sky who all talk to each other and so anytime anything gets close it's it's noticed and it's discussed and so there's no like i know that people love conspiracy theories about nasa's hiding this and the government's hiding that but when it's a, a thing that's in the sky you can't hide it <laughs> like you anybody with a with a good enough telescope and the right kind of skill can observe it and so you uh and jpl is one of the places this um, near earth object program is one of the places that acts as kind of a clearinghouse for public communication about these things and so they're a really good place to go anytime anybody's posting about ah this asteroid's going to hit us next week just go to their website and you can see what they're communicating about and you'll see that most of their press releases are like no, this asteroid is not going to hit us next week. <laughs> right. And, and but Mars and, and this all I'll let this be the, the last question, because I, I, I know that we've gone over the hour now, but thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. So with with Mars, though, what about asteroid impacts with Mars? Because Mars, you know, very thin atmosphere. Oh, they happen all the time. And in fact, we have um, we have spacecraft that are you know, taking lots of pictures of the surface and some of them have lower resolution cameras that cover a wider area and then they have higher resolution cameras that cover a narrower area. So one of the kind of medium resolution cameras is called context camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is constantly taking pictures all over Mars and periodically when they get one of those pictures down, they'll look at it and they'll compare it to an old picture and they'll say, oh, here's a new dark spot there. And so they'll target that new dark spot with the high resolution camera and then you can see brand new impact craters on Mars. And these are really cool because sometimes they expose subsurface ice and then high-rise keeps looking at it again and again and you can see the ice just sublimates away over time. Um, sometimes an impact will happen into like a crater wall and it'll cause a little avalanche of a dry like rock fall down the wall and you can see like this new surface has been exposed. Um, and pretty soon NASA is gonna be launching a spacecraft called InSight which is a seismometer equipped lander. And so those impacts are actually gonna be great because they, they basically are like an explosion test. So if an impact happens um, you know, within several hundred kilometers of InSight, it'll generate an earthquake wave that will help InSight see what's happening, see the, the internal structure of Mars. The odds of InSight itself getting hit by an asteroid are about the same as the odds of you or me getting hit by an asteroid. It's, vanishingly small but mars is a big planet it has as much um land cover as earth does it's just that mars doesn't have oceans right and so it it does get asteroids do hit it and those are really interesting for science and they don't pose any threat at all to to any of the landers or orbiters just because it's it's a big enough place that the odds of anything actually impacting anything we care about are vanishingly tiny yeah and and again i mean so that should that should ease a lot of people's minds for here on earth because this guy's closer to the asteroid belt too that's right although the asteroids are also moving more slowly out there um they move at slower speeds and mars also has lower gravity so earth for us 
um, we're closer to the sun, asteroids mm -hmm. are moving at higher speeds, and we have higher gravity. So there's more impact energy into Earth than there is into Mars. Look at Mercury. Um, that's that's a good example yeah, of that, I know, too. Poor Mercury. <laughs> there is one more thing I want to mention. Um, there's a, a, something that some of your viewers might be concerned about is this news about this Chinese space station that's going to be um, crashing to Earth yes. this weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to assuage everybody's fears about that. Um, we're beginning to know. Uh, like uh, until the last couple of days, we haven't had really a clue where it would come down except between like 45 North and 45 South, which is like two thirds of the planet. Um, but the fact is it's not really a very big spacecraft and it's mostly gonna break up. Almost none of it's gonna survive to hit the ground, which means that that's basically, there's virtually no chance of um, anybody getting harmed by this. We get hit by asteroids of this size all the time. They break up, they come down where, where they land in the ocean or, and nothing ever happens. The coolest thing that could happen is that um, as it begins to come down and we are able to make better and better predictions of where it's gonna pass, is that if it does happen to fall close to a city, it's going to make an amazing sky show as it breaks up. It'll be very colorful. It'll be like the stream of fireworks as the spacecraft enters the atmosphere and then burns up. And so I'm hoping, actually, that it will get close to a city because then we'll have lots and lots of awesome cell phone video of this thing breaking up as it enters the atmosphere and it still won't do anybody any harm. Um, we don't know when it's going to happen uh, yet, but it's probably going to be, yes, around April Fool's Day. So also watch out for internet hoaxes about, ah, oh, peas crashed on my car and blah, 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 because uh, that's almost certainly going to be false. Um, a lot I of fake news. A lot of fake news will come news. from this. <laughs> Go to planetary.org slash blogs and look for a blog entry I posted yesterday with some links to some places where you can get reliable information about what's going on with that space station. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And guys, You're I welcome. have her link in here. And again, look, look for her book soon, yes, soon, TM. Book. Book, The Design and Engineering of Curiosity. There you, you can go. can pre-order it on Amazon right now. So please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And we will be in touch. I would love to have you back on later at another time um, if you if you are available. So thank you so much. Sure. All right. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Isn't she amazing?